We're going to talk about open source today and some exciting news, including an exclusive interview from Linus Torvalds on GitHub. You definitely want to stay around to check that video out. But I first want to start by talking about Thundermail, which is Mozilla Thunderbird's plan to create a privacy first, fully open source alternative to Gmail and Office 365. Why is this important? Well, we're going to get into that. But let's start by talking about the announcement. Today, we're pleased to announce what many in our open source contributor community already know. The Thunderbird team is working on an email service called Thundermail, as well as file sharing, calendar scheduling, and other helpful cloud-based services that bundle with what we're calling Thunderbird Pro. Why is this such of a massive announcement? Well, the key takeaway here is that this upcoming email service by Mozilla is to combat things like ads, so no ads are going to be featured, no selling of data, and no AI training. This all goes against what a lot of people believe services like Gmail or Outlook are doing, which a lot of people believe those services are doing stuff like AI training and selling data. So this is an interesting alternative that's supposed to be open source and privacy focused. Why are they doing this? Well, the claim here is that Gmail and Outlook are mainly used because of convenience. The fact that you can create an account easily, have cloud storage and integrated apps all together in the cloud makes it super convenient to use. So seemingly that's why Mozilla has come up with these services in order to combat the big players. This is a big move for Mozilla and I'm glad to see something great coming out of them. Let's talk about what these services are. Thunderbird Appointment, Thunderbird Send, and Thunderbird Assist. These three additional tools in the suite of tools is first off, a calendar that allows you to schedule meetings for businesses and individuals. Think of Calendly, and this would be an alternative to that. Then we have Thunderbird Send, which is encrypted file sharing. And finally, Thunderbird Assist. It's an optional AI assistant in which it touts that it's not going to send data to big tech. It's a pretty great move, honestly, by Thunderbird and the Mozilla team. As this new Thundermail service is going to build upon all the people that love Thunderbird already. Thunderbird has been actually growing over the last few years. As for a while, the outlook looked bleak for the service, but this is really cool to see as Thundermail could be the go-to solution for users who want the ease of things like a cloud service, for example, just like Gmail would offer, but it has true open source and privacy behind the implementation. I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of people who make the switch just because they don't want their data sold. We're gonna leave you with final thoughts here from the article. You may be thinking this all sounds expensive. How will Thunderbird be able to pay for it? And that's a great question. Services such as Send are actually quite expensive. Storage is costly. So here's the plan. At the beginning, there will be paid subscription plans at a few different tiers. Once we have sufficiently strong base of paying users to sustainably support our services, we plan to introduce a limited free tier to the public. You see this with other providers. Limitations are standard as free email and file sharing are prone to abuse. I think that's a fair strategy in order to get this service out to the masses. Let me know what you think about this new service offering from Mozilla Firefox. This is definitely nice to see as they've had multiple struggles over the last few months. This looks like a step in the right direction away from their terms of service rollout and debacle. I'm excited to see this move. And before we move on to one of the most exciting things that has dropped this week, I want you to take a moment and subscribe below. YouTube can get finicky and you wouldn't want to miss another video. Also, on the way back up, smash that like button for me. Now I want to talk about Git. For those of you unaware, Git is a free and open source distributed version control system designed to handle everything from small to very large projects with speed and efficiency. All Git is is really a smart filing system that tracks every change that someone makes to a dev project, so mainly in programming and code. It keeps a full history of all revisions and versions that were made to the code. It also lets multiple people safely work on that code at the same time, allows you to go back to any previous version if something breaks, and helps combine everyone changes in an organized way. That way people don't lose work there's no more guessing which is the latest and greatest file, and it has totally changed the way that we program and keep track of things over the last two decades. Now, why is this important? Well, the person we're gonna be talking about today is Linus Torvalds, who is also the creator and founder of Linux. Linus actually is the one who created, originally, Git as well. Git was originally created by Linus Torvalds for version control during the development of the Linux kernel. The trademark Git is registered by the Software Freedom 
Conservancy, marking its official recognition and continued evolution in the open source community. That's right, Linus was the one who actually came up with Git for those of you unaware. It's primarily written in C and now there are GUI apps and programming scripts that help us use Git, but the overall protocol was designed by Linus. And nowadays, Git is the most popular version control system available out there with nearly 95% of developers reporting using it. There are also many different repository services, including GitHub, the largest one, SourceForge, and Bitbucket that are all based on the Git version control protocol. The initial release was April 7th, 2005. And with that release comes an awesome interview that I wanna talk about as so many softwares, such as the entire GitHub platform would not exist if Git did not exist. It's in the name. Build and ship software on a single collaborative platform, GitHub. This is not an endorsement for GitHub, although I do use it, but it just goes to show you how wild it is that Linus has created two massive projects that have not only stood the test of time, but have spawned massive industries and platforms like all the Linux distributions, also with Git, all the different repositories that make millions of dollars a year just hosting your code at this point. All from open source. And that's why it's so cool to see this interview. Now I can't play the interview, at least not right now, but the interview is called Two Decades of Git, a conversation with the creator, Linus Torvald. And this is sponsored by GitHub. I have watched the video entirely, and I just wanna go through some of the main points here as this is a reflection on the last two decades of Git by Linus and the too long don't watch version of this I'll talk about, but I strongly encourage you to watch this. I'm gonna put a link in the description below so you can check this video out for yourself. It's about a 40 minute video, but it's a wonderful conversation. So Linus Torvalds reflects on the 20th anniversary of Git here. Originally, he created Git in 2005 as a personal solution to keep track of the Linux kernel after he lost access to BitKeeper, which was their previous source control tool because of licensing issues. And Git was born out of that frustration. There were existing tools, but they didn't work with the kernel workflow. So Linus wrote the first usable version of Git in about 10 days, which is quite amazing to think about. Although admittedly he had spent months thinking about the design beforehand. The core ideas were simplicity at a low level, speed and distributed development. The verification system used SHA-1 hashes and later migrated over to SHA-256 hash. The early Git was difficult to use because of design as Linus didn't care about conventional approaches in source control. The adoption initially grew slow, but exploded after projects like Ruby on Rails started using it. Linus handed off Git maintainership to Junio Homano after just a few months, praising Junio's taste and long-term dedication. Linus now uses Git casually for the kernel, mostly through the command line, but he's very impressed at how Git has scaled from kernel development to powering the world's Biggest projects, he sees Git's distributed nature as its key strength and still uses Git to this day as it solves most of his issues. And when asked, Linus at the end says he doesn't plan on starting any other big projects unless he's forced to, he rather just use good tools that are built by others. A fantastic conversation that was had here. Again, I encourage you to watch the interview. And speaking on open source, let's get into the next topic. I just gained access to the 2025 state of the open source report from Open Logic by Perforce. It talks about open source software usage, market trends, and analysis. I want to go through a few of the main points here and some of the analytics that were given to us, as it's quite exciting to see this summary report brought to us in collaboration with the Open Source Initiative and the Eclipse Foundation. So in the survey, they talk about open source usage investment and support challenges, open source Linux distributions, open source infrastructure software, cloud native open source technologies, open source frameworks, open source programming languages and runtimes, and much more about open source. But I wanna hit on a few of the most exciting things to see as one of the biggest takeaways from this entire thing is whether open source grew, stay the same or declined. Well, 96% of organizations either increase or maintain their use of open source software in the past year. And a quarter of them, 25.71% reported a significant increase. This is wild. As you can imagine, a majority of these organizations 
are using open source as a cost savings. And a whopping 53% of companies chose open source software because it was a cost savings to them. That actually overtook vendor lock-in or technical reasons for switching to OSS. And this growth here that we see is mainly being driven by cloud infrastructure, containers, and data tech. Moving on to the next surprise, at least for me, is the amount of software that is reaching end of life and how many large enterprises are using it. 26% of organizations are still using end of life CentOS, including 40% of large enterprises. And alarmingly, 25% of these enterprises have yet to decide on a migration plan. That's pretty wild as end of life software users are three times more likely to fail security compliance audits. I can't believe that some of these big enterprises are still using CentOS after it was discontinued almost, I wanna say like two or three years ago at this point. Anyways, something very interesting out of this state of open source report and survey. When it comes to containerization software, both Docker and Kubernetes are really dominating. 59.3% of users use Docker containers and 39.2 use Kubernetes. That's a big deal. But we can see a huge growth in using Kubernetes over the last four years. It's nearly doubled. That means it's growing quicker than any other open source containerization software. We'll see if that trend continues. And now probably the one that most people want to see and talk about. What is the most used Linux distribution, at least in enterprise? According to the survey, 56.73% of the respondents said that they're using Ubuntu. Ubuntu is the most used regardless of company size and in all regions except Asia, where CentOS is still the top distribution. That's kind of funny. As CentOS is completely at the end of life at this point, still there's almost 26% of big business using it. Hopefully people will get off of CentOS at this point and go to alternatives like Alma Linux or Rocky Linux, but only time will tell. There's a lot more to this survey as the state of open source. I'm going to link it in the description below if you want to check out more in-depth information. There's a lot covered in the survey and we can't get through all of it. I just wanted to cover some of the highlights that I was excited to read about, but I know there's more for you. What do you think about all this open source news? Did you enjoy going through the results? Let me know. Either way, go down and smash that like button for me and subscribe below for more videos like this. Catch me in a great community on Discord and I'll catch you in another video. Thanks for watching. Linux can be hard to understand, but I take the most commonly used terms, commands, and subjects in Linux and I break them down into simple to read documents, including Linux terms, flashcards, a checklist, a cheat sheet, and a mind map. And if you're ready to level up your Linux experience and knowledge, go to SavvyNick.com now and get access to these sheets.